Wrapping with Reef Bum is sponsored by Bulk Reef Supply and Ecotech Marine. Hey, what's happening, everybody? And welcome back to another episode of Wrapping with Reef Bum. I'm your host, Keith Perkelhammer. So tonight, this is this is a real pleasure because I'm welcoming Dong Zhou from Acro Garden. What's going on there, Dong? Hi, how are you? It's great to be on your show. Yeah, yeah. I'm really excited about this conversation. I've known Dong for um, for many, many years, and he's got a very, very interesting background. He's a scientist, so this is going to be a kind of a different discussion. We're going we're gonna to probably talk about a lot of different things, but it's going to be very interesting to hear this um, perspective from a, from a scientific background. But um, just a little um, information about Dong for those of you to... Um, understand what he is all about. He has a PhD in chemistry and worked for several pharmaceutical companies in various therapeutic areas, including anti-inflammatory, cancer, pain management, and anti-infectious diseases. Dong developed his first interest in marine invertebrates when he was working as a postdoc at the University of Virginia. He has been in the aquarium hobby since he was in college, and he initially focused on keeping fancy designer goldfish and discus. He got into saltwater in 2004 after setting up his first marine fish tank for a Nemo and after he discovered the Boston Reefer Society. Yeah, yeah. Um, yep. About 10 years ago, he co-founded his first company on drug discovery. Soon after that, he was able to combine his passion for coral and his experience in the pharmaceutical industry and co-founded a new company, Ecove Biomarine. This company focused on aquaculture, coral for drug discovery and bone grafting. I'm going to ask you that question there, uh, Dong, in a second, what that's all about. Sure. Um, his current company, Acro Garden Inc., was then founded to hold the intellectual properties and to study coral farming. Acro Garden is now his primary focus. The company produces aquaculture coral, mainly SPS, for the hobby. So before we start chatting with Dong, I do want to thank the sponsors for the show, both Paul Bulk Reef Supply and Ecotech Marine. I really appreciate these companies supporting this uh, show and the stream. I also really appreciate you folks out there tuning in. Please spread the word. Hit that like button. Smash that like button so more people can uh, find this live stream. And as always, we always encourage comments and questions via the chat. So, so Dong, man, this is uh, 
quite a, quite a background, very impressive uh, background. I'm really looking forward to this uh, discussion because, you know, I mentioned you're a scientist and and your approach to the hobby is is unique, you know, from that perspective, and and that's fascinating to me. I'm um, I'm sort of a data guy myself. I, I used to work in the media industry on the market research side, so I used to work a lot with, uh, you know, on on the media and advertising business in, in terms of working a lot with numbers. So um, yeah, I'm uh, I'm looking forward to this. So uh, just a couple of things in terms of what we uh, what I mentioned in the um, beginning in terms of your uh, your bio. Can um, you give us some more insight in terms of the eco of biomarine and and how coral aquaculture helped? with the drug, uh, drug uh, discovery and bone grafting that's um i guess in, in simple to understand terms but it sounds okay. pretty fascinating to me uh yeah it was it's very fascinating because that um coral does produce a lot of natural products so uh when we do drug discovery and then we normally we grab uh, uh we synthesize some complex fancy molecule and a lot of this thing is this molecule are actually cannot be man-made from scratch uh, but we can find this interesting molecule in nature. So back many, many years ago, and then there is uh, quite a bit of interest into marine uh, animal that the, the metabolize, the compounds they produce. So those compounds are pretty unique and have a, uh, actually a, a many uh, drug candidates for like cancer, inflammatory, antibacterial, they're actually all based on natural products. So um, coral actually produced a very rich library of them. But now there's a problem, is that most of coral are protected. So uh, there is an um, uh, interesting, interesting point about drug discovery. For example, no matter how fancy, how great your drug is, if you cannot manufacture in large quantity, there's no future. For example, if you discover uh, maybe like Potenzinia, for matter of fact, that's a true, that's a fact. Uh, back in 2012 or 11, uh, University of Cairo actually published a paper. They isolated about 40 something, very unique compound from our post senior, which is a wheat, uh, which is not really that interesting, but they grow like wheat. Um, those uh, compound has uh, very good drug properties. So it's serving as a base uh, to do modification, to bring out new drugs. And that is uh, where this uh, using um, coral, the you know, marine animals, uh, the, the metabolite, the compound in their body, the compound they produce as a, a starting material uh, to making drugs. But you cannot go down there and hack up uh, two tons of aquapora. <laughs> you can't do that. For matter of fact, I don't think you can go there and hack up two tons of uh, Xenia either. Yeah. For example, that, 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 uh, that is where this idea come from uh, is to uh, aquaculture coral. For example, if I want to study Xenia, I want to use Xenia as a starting point for uh, drug discovery. I can get a swimming pool. And then you can get a swimming pool among Xenia. So that's soft. Uh, the, the biggest problem is the source of this material. And because the Xenia uh, or whatever coral we are doing, we're growing uh, aquaculture. So they are not limited by the international treaty. So they're no longer in danger. They no longer uh, has a limitation for import, export, moving around, that kind of thing. That's the idea about using uh, aquaculture coral uh, for drug discovery. And bone grafting is an interesting thing. Mm -hmm. uh, for a matter of fact, coral skeleton has been used in bone grafting for a long time. And I believe there's an Israel company also doing the same thing is by aquaculturing uh, uh, aquapora, or some of them are actually poritis, and some of them are, uh, what exactly is that? Oh, Gandipora. And actually, just incredible, also get into the same uh, area before, and he also looked into growing Gandipora and for bone grafting, because that uh, coral skeleton, the calcium carbonate, and there already shows that uh, the, the rejection of a human bone, the human body, to this uh, coral skeleton is pretty minimal. So that is one thing. Uh, of course, that um, uh, right now uh, on, on the drug discovery and bone grafting part is pretty much in the past. So right now, actually, I'm enjoying my beautiful coral and then grow them to supply to the local community as well as online, online retailers. So the idea is that- And you're based out of the Boston area. 
Yep, Boston area. I'm in Concord, Massachusetts. So uh, not New Hampshire. <laughs> That's the biggest confusion. Yeah. Um, uh, what happened is that uh, the way I think about it is that one colony of Agropora, we can grow aquaculture here. Is one less colony uh, being collected in the wild. For matter of fact, the, the truth is much worse than that. To get you a piece of uh, uh, aqua, for example, like a five inch little colony, there are probably 10 of them get hacked up on the reef and get destroyed. And then uh, to get one that actually has some color on it, that which is sellable, uh, marketable agapora, you probably destroy about 50 of them in a reef. And plus that the uh, loss between uh, transit, there's a huge amount of loss. So that is why every piece of coral that actually is extremely valuable because that, that piece of coral from the Great Barrier Reef reach your tank and then the 50 siblings of him dead, perish. Yeah. So that is why I'm totally supporting the aquaculture effort. For a matter of fact, it goes to a uh, uh, certain extent is that I'm no longer purchasing wild coral, at least for two years. All the coral, all the source, all the seed colonies, all from hobbyists, or at least that uh, uh, is being aquaculture uh, in, a, in certain shops. So uh, basically, I do not believe in collecting wild coral for a hobby. Also, this is one reason that we get such a black eye from all these uh, media uh, politicians. But aquaculture and coral can get us to keep the hobby, enjoying the hobby, also minimize the damage of the natural reef. That is my uh, point of view about aquaculture and coral. And also that uh, uh, in my dream, actually I'm thinking about this and trying to do this is everybody aquaculture and coral. And then I can serve as a, a, a point like a, tree, a stock exchange. So you bring in your coral, must be aquaculture. That, that's, uh, uh, that's very fundamental, uh, that is uh, very important. Your aquaculture coral here, I either can buy it or actually you can just let it sit in my tank. And then because that the more traffic come here to get coral and then you catch somebody's eye, this coral can go to the new home. So for matter of fact, it's very interesting is that uh, many, many of my coral actually came, they came home. For example, I got the coral I sold several years ago as a frag and now came home as a big colony. <laughs> and look, look at this beauty, this guy here, used to be a frack. I think that probably took about two or three years, something like that. And now I just got this corner economy back. Uh, what, 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 uh, what uh, do you recall the name on it? I know you're not into the name uh, game. That's a red planet. That's a good o o -R -A Oh, red, red planet. planet. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, yeah, yeah. folks, I can, look at I it. can, I can vouch, uh, because I've been, I've, I've visited Dong's uh, place there uh, a few times and, uh, the man knows how to grow coral and, and, um, he actually put together a video for us and and I'm gonna uh, I'm gonna start playing that um, that video Doug, and we could still uh, talk because it doesn't have any uh, sound yep, and this this will give everybody yep. kind of like a sense in terms of the kind of master that Dong is in terms of raising captive grown <laughs> uh, it's mostly SPS right is that a uh, yeah, am I looking at SPS. like a, um, a, a a tiry purple monster it looks very tiry purple monsterish the uh, the first uh, <laughs> couple of corals I'm seeing there but maybe it's your purple rainbow uh, actually. Oh, it's a purple rainbow. Yeah, purple that, rainbow. That, that's the one that you have. Yes. Too. Yeah, I yeah. love that coral. Um, yeah, I love it too. So, talk to us, uh, Dong, about uh, how you like to, um, you know, keep uh, your systems running in terms of the equipment. And let's talk about lighting last, because I know you got a lot of uh, thoughts on, okay. on lighting. But yep. just take us through in terms of the equipment that you typically use and how you like to run a, um, you know, your SPS uh, systems. Yep. Uh, actually, that I, uh, I want to tell a story that uh, many, many years ago, when Tyree actually came to Boston River Society to give a, give a talk, I got to be there. So I went there. And bef I talked to people before the, the show, before the talk, before Tyree gave his speech, and everybody was expecting what kind of fancy equipment he has and what kind of fancy method he run. Then Tyree get on the stage and he said, well, glass box? pick up from the yard cell, 400 watt metal halide, uh, some Tanzi Waymaker, I don't remember exactly if it's Tanzi or something like that. 
good move, a uh, water movement, and at a corner there's some algae. That's it. Oh, I can see some people get pretty disappointed, but that I think is what started my uh, philosophy of keeping coral. So uh, raising coral for uh, drug discovery purpose is entirely different from raising coral for hobbyists. Yeah. Because that uh, if you raise coral for drug discovery, you want them to grow really, really fast. And then you push a lot of boundaries, push a lot of limits, proprietary stuff and all that kind of stuff. That, But for growing coral for hobbyists, the most important thing, this is a hobby. And I have to consider taking into the factor that what kind of environment this coral going to be at when they reach the new owner's home. And yes, uh, the condition is so varied. So I want to make my coral as a uh, jack of all trades or as robust as possible. That means that uh, the way I keep my coral is to make them... Uh, Bulletproof. It's a, like a training ground. Bulletproof. Huh? Bulletproof. Bulletproof. Exactly. That's the word I'm looking for. <laughs> Bulletproof. So that means that I use uh, the minimum amount of equipment. So basically what I have is good lighting. So that that is something that you cannot uh, escape. Uh, good water movement. Um, a big protein skimmer for each system. Um, then I dose a little bit of the additive. I won't say if they're trace element. I'm get, going to get to that part. So basically, um, yes, uh, no mechanical filtration. There's a reason for that. No mechanical, no mechanical that, filtration. Yeah, no mechanical filtration. The reason for that is that the, uh, in seawater, uh, there are so many little life forms flying around, cocopods, all that kind of thing. Remember many, many years ago, and then there is an aquaculture company in Europe. They have a patent on something uh, uh, about the coral farming. They go through this extent to make sure there is no mechanical filtration or anything that can hurt the cocoa pots. So they actually patented the wave maker have a gigantic propeller rotating at very slow speed. That way it won't chop the cocoa pot. That's one thing. Second thing is that they re use a reverse sum. That means the sum actually higher hmm. than your tank. The water being pumped up and to the refugium, the refugium have all these life form cocoa pot in it, and they flow naturally back into the tank. So the cocoa pot does not go through the propeller. Gotcha. It's, yeah. So, and also mechanical filtration, yes, I read a paper somewhere, is that they analyze what's actually collecting on the filter sock. What's collecting on the filter sock is a lot of bacteria, lots of organic material, and lots of dead cocoa pots. <laughs> Basically, we kill them by the filter sock, and then we're creating our Newton problem. And then we buy chemical to solve that problem. So basically, is, uh, that is the reason that there's no mechanical filtration or sometimes it's unavoidable. For example, like a carbon reactor. I, run, I do run carbon once in a while, but it's not 24-7. So the carbon reactor uh, does have a pump that has a mechanical uh, propeller can pot potentially chopping through cocoa pot. But I set the pump at the extremely low speed. So no that, no uh, yeah. mechanical filtration. So you know, um, folks run mechanical filtration to help control nutrients, right? Because you want to help um, you know pull out potentially like detritus and other things in the water column that mm -hmm. could potentially um, you know fuel a a nutrient spike. What are you doing to um, you know to export your nutrients? Is it pretty much the protein skimmer that you're leaning on and 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 some something else? Actually, kind kind of uh, interesting point you brought up about the protein skimmer. My protein skimmer actually set at an extremely low uh, dry skim. Basically, right now, I probably empty the skimmer cup about once a week. <laughs> um, in terms of a nutrient export, so the uh, important thing about what exactly is a nutrient. I know what your nutrient what exactly I, I, I'm going to answer your question there, Dong. It's the corals yep. that are doing the legwork, right? That's the, uh, the corals. Exactly. Yes. Is a coral doing the leg work and also the sponge in the sun well, is doing the leg work? Let me ask you a question, though. For those folks yeah. out there that are just kind of getting into the hobby or just starting up a tank, would you recommend they start off with no mechanical filtration? Do you think they should have mechanical filtration in the beginning and then once they have a mature system, then they could potentially pull the socks? I think that at the beginning that the mechanical filtration is quite beneficial. Uh, the reason for that is that before that your biological uh, filtration, 
can take the major role to cleaning your tank. Right. You need something to clean your tank. So when you start out a tank, even for a season a hobbyist, and you use all the live rock from your previous system. So for the probably for the first several months, I would recommend you still have the mechanical filtration and you have as many as uh, exporting mechanism available, running activated carbon and you can uh, set your skimmer pretty wet. So until they fully establish and then you will run into a different issue is that you don't have enough nitrate, don't have enough phosphate. This is what I'm having right now is that I have the dose nitrate to keep the, the coral happy. Yeah, because they're um, sucking it all up. Exactly. <laughs> and actually, it's not just the coral. Uh, it's the sponge. The, uh, so in my sum, and the sponge basically is just everywhere. And the sponge actually filter out a lot of things. And there's one important thing about uh, uh, silicate. So people keep talking about silicates and... Um, uh, they cause dino, cyano, and all that kind of thing. How to remove them? Sponge is your friend. Sponge actually is uh, they striving on high silicate content, and actually they require that. So basically, when a tank is mature, it's more like a, a ecosystem. And one other thing about these traders I want to talk about that is that if you go to a store or go to bulk resupply, you will find out the, something called the Fiji mud. What exactly is Fiji mud? So Fiji mud is that uh, a wasp nest, and they found a two mile diameter of big pool of mud. That's what I heard, okay? <laughs> oh, that's where I read about that. So basically is the ocean's septic system. So in the ocean, this mud pool exists and then they're the breeding ground for all the, all this beneficial uh, bacterial, cocoa pods, all that kind of thing actually in turn feed the coral. So that is that the detritus, what happened for the detritus in the sum, I let them accumulate in the sum. You let I them detritus, to you let, you, them you're out. saying you let the detritus accumulate. Yeah. yeah, just let them sit there. And, and that is the reason that in, the, in my sums and the uh, flow is very slow. They don't stir up the detritus. And sometimes that uh, those detritus actually accumulate in my big 200 gallon tank because that uh, there's uh, some area that uh, a pretty low flow and then I have engineer Gobi. And when I got him, he's three inch, very cute, colorful. Right now, two yeah. feet. <laughs> it looked like a giant. He's a gi snake. gigantic, jeez, uh, uh, that's it's gonna give me some nightmares yeah. there, Doc. So, oh, yeah, exactly. Uh, so, and it's black and yellow. So you will create atomic explosion <laughs> in my 200 gallon reef. <laughs> Boom, and it's really uh, up. Quick question for you. What are your nitrates and phosphates? What do you typically run those at? Okay, uh, here's a, Interesting. Uh, my phosphate, I keep them at 0.5 ppm, not 0 0.05. It's 0 0.5 ppm. Say and that again. Your your oh, phosphates are 0.05. Yep. Uh, okay. No, no, 0 0.5. Not Zero. 0 0.05. 0 0.5. That Point, is so the, in the danger zone. 0 0.5 <laughs> phosphates. Yes, 0 0.5 phosphate. Actually, at my LPS system, at 1 ppm phosphate. Wow. Yep. Now, how I look at the phosphate. Well, actually, and, and uh, you have no algae. Of, you have yeah. no algae in your systems, no, right? No, right. Uh, I want to talk about that too. So that is a is a, a good way to get into that. So uh, phosphate actually is quite important. It's a basic building block of all the life forms. And there's a plenty of videos and literature to supporting that uh, importance of phosphate. For example, uh, that is uh, I remember I read a uh, actually it's a scientific study. So they have several tanks and then all identical. And they have a different phosphate level. So one has a zero phosphate, one has a like 0.1, the other one 0.5, the other one is one. And they put in uh, the same colony, actually the frag cut from the same colony, some fast growing SPS, so they can compare. So uh, I think they run the study about three months or something like that, don't call me on that. And they actually take the frags out to weigh them on a scale right. to see how much growth they have. So if we jump to the conclusion here is that the conclusion is that the higher phosphate up to one ppm, the coral grows faster. And now about the original idea about phosphate. In 1975, and there's a research paper published out, talk about phosphate. So the author hypothesized about what the danger is about phosphate because what they found is that at a phosphate rich area, coral skeleton density is lower. So that they, they grow the, they grow slower is what they're saying. 
no, no, the core, the 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 por- how porous the coral uh, skeleton density okay. is is uh, lower, so the coral become more brittle. Yeah. So then the idea is that uh, they hypothesize about the phosphate we poison the crystal lattice when the coral forming their skeletons, which lead to a coral that is uh, uh, more brittle and more easy to be damaged, and that's pretty much it. And then later on. The following up study, that's many, many, many years later, it found out that, yeah, the, the coral at high phosphate area, they have uh, more brittle bones, but they grow faster. Now, when we look in our hobby, because this is a hobby, not, not go there and protect the reef or do environmental study. Uh, the scientists who are doing the environmental protection, looking at a coral reef, look after them, they have a different perspective. Because when a coral uh, has a, a more porous uh, the, the skeleton structure, and they, they are easy to get damaged by like a big wave, or, and, uh, and also they call the erosion of the skeleton. Yeah, it, it's a little bit issue. And also another issue opposed to uh, those uh, scientists is that it's difficult to judge uh, the environmental impact when you see coral growing pretty fast. Uh, that's quite an interesting argument over there. So that is mostly a negative uh, argument against phosphate on a natural reef. But in our tank, does it really matter? So uh, as long as you don't have Nielsen LG, and then the tank is pretty clean at 0.5 ppm phosphate, and then the core will grow faster. Voila, why not? And also look at the Acropora. Uh, yeah, they maybe the, the bone density is a little bit lower. And uh, when you cut through the frag saw, actually you cut through, cut through it pretty easily. But do you really care? Does it really matter? No, it doesn't. It actually, with a higher phosphate level and then the coral grow faster, so coral farming actually is a bonus because now it's a different purpose of the, the way to looking at phosphate. And also that we, we see there's some evidence that uh, showing that when the phosphate is really low, coral has a difficulty to taking in phosphate. So uh, that's the perception, yeah, right? That the perception yeah. is like yeah, the higher phosphates could inhibit coral growth, and not that's the perception in the hobby. Yes, it's a perception because that there's enough scientific evidence showing that higher phosphate actually accelerate coral growth. Period. Done. Uh, let me thank uh, Paul Great Beard Reef for that extremely, extremely generous super chat. Thank you, man, Paul, and uh, the comments on behalf of the Boston Reefer Society. Thanks for the continued support of yourself, Keith, along with Dong. We really appreciate the both of you. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. Big, uh, big appreciation uh, from both of us to, uh, to, to you and, and um, well, Boston Reefer Society. But all right, Dong, so we're talking uh, phosphate. Okay. Yeah. So. Yep. Um, right. I mean. Typically, people are, you know, trying to keep phosphates and nitrates in check because uh, those will, you know, a lot of times fuel uh, algae outbreaks and, and that sort of thing. And would that be more, um, you know, true in terms of younger systems versus older systems? You know, I, I guess the question to me is where, where do you kind of, um, you know, achieve that balance if you've got very high phosphates? And I'm assuming you've got high, mm-hmm. what, what were your nitrates again? Did you mention your nitrates? Uh, nitrate, I actually have to dose it up to like 5 ppm. So, okay, so you're dosing the yeah. uh, the nitrates and all that stuff. But yeah. so w- where, where is the balance in terms of, you know, that fine line and, and, and being able to avoid the uh, cyano and, and the bryopsis and all that stuff when you've got mm-hmm. such high phosphate levels and people are just trying to drive them down is... What uh, what would be your advice to people that have uh, those kinds of issues? Uh, gas the urgent, gas snails, and if you have a big tank, well, welcome to Dory. <laughs> Dory yellow tank. Actually, these days yellow tank is insane. The price is too expensive, but you can get a Scopus tank. A Scopus tank will do as good as a job as a cleanup crew as a yellow tank, and they are relatively inexpensive. And uh, I talk about the dory. I don't know where the dory goes now. So the dory actually is not really that effective against mm. LG. It does some. Looks, yeah, looks good. It, it, there's some impact on that. Yeah, it looks good. It's pretty. It's part of the film crew, yeah. right? The Finding Nemo. And um, that's why I always have dory. I have many, many dory everywhere. Um, so I, I'm, I'm, I'm watching some comments coming through here. And Filipino uh, reef, reefers making a couple comments about water changes and um 
Mm-hmm. Yeah. So Don, what's, what's your philosophy in terms of water changes? Do, uh, do you do weekly water changes? And if you do, how, what percent would you say you do? I do daily water daily changes. Daily water changes. Yes. The water change is the king. So basically, uh, the way you look at this, the best water, the clearest water, the ultimate water you can give your coral is the water you just mix. <laughs> so basically, uh, water change is, uh, there are some, uh, many questions about, regarding water change. One thing is that, uh, well, uh, back to your question, is that I do a daily water change. So every month, I approximately replace 10% of the uh, total water volume. So I basically have 2,000 gallon total, uh, mostly in frac tanks. So I run through a box of Eastern Ocean Reef Crystal every week. Um, here comes the question, and mostly, uh, uh, many people ask this question. You change 10% of water, and that means 90% of the junk still in the water. Mm. So for example, if you clean your bathroom 10%, and it still looks pretty up, yeah. right? But how does 10% water help? Here comes the uh, interesting fact, is that when your coral gets stressed by certain things, for example, let's say your coral gets stressed by um, uh, impurity A, um, then uh, there is a biological effect here. So any impurity, you call it junk or garbage or whatever, can affect a coral, they have to reach certain concentration before that they can affect coral. Just like you're taking medicine, you have to take the enough dose to have effect. So try to imagine that uh, this element A is accumulating in your root mm. tank and then you pass the threshold and now your coral get affected. You do 10% water change, boom, you set it back right. below the level that can affect the coral. You don't have to totally remove them, and you just need to set them back. So this is what the 10% water change actually can get some impact. And that actually, in reality, you can see that after you do water change, uh, some of the coral just perk up. They looks pretty, that looks better immediately. Even though you left 90%, of the harmful substance, if you want to call it, but you set their level, the concentration below uh, the level that they can affect coral. That is how the, that 10% water change can actually make it work. That's the reason. Uh, how, um, how important is trace element uh, supplementation ah. besides water okay. changes? <laughs> yep. And the water change, uh, they do bring some of the trace element back, but here's the thing. Uh, uh, first of all, I dose this thing first. Amino acid, there's no trace element. They're actually more like micronutrients, but somehow you get all mixed up in the trace field. So amino acid, scientific proven. And I you, so dose you dose iodine. aminos. Yep, I dose aminos. Um, that is uh, have sufficient amount of uh, proof on scientific study and real life. Uh, even if you listen to Jake Adams, yeah, definitely. I totally agree with him. That thing is like a miracle. And also that uh, uh, there is uh, enough scientific paper showing how coral actually benefit from that. Uh, the other thing is iodine. So iodine get depleted really, really quickly in the water, even though the salt mix can have some, but then you were looking at iodine to totally gone in overnight because that is huge amount of consumption. Unfortunately, there's really no good test kit for it including ICP tests. ICP tests for iodine does not do very well. So based, and also the home uh, test kit for hobbyists, very difficult to use, highly inaccurate. So in that case, just drop some in. So that is the thing, the iodine is something I don't- You're saying I, I, iodine or iodide? I, iodine, actually, both? The, the iodine, the, that, that is the, the I negative. So that's what it does. Uh, actually, if you dose those brown stuff, you will turn into the clear stuff immediately in your tank, the bacteria will just metabolize it or there's something will reduce it into a useful form. So it really doesn't really matter which one you dose. You can dose Lugo solution or you go, go to, you can dose the Seachem Reef iodine. But they're so cheap, you can, what I do is I just go on Amazon and buy the potassium iodine and then mix my own solution. Simple, easy and effective. Yep. And another thing I, I uh, keep an eye on is potassium. So I cannot emphasize enough about potassium. So even though uh, uh, kind of interesting thing is that even we have so much sodium in seawater, 
we only have 400 ppm of potassium. That's even lower than calcium uh, in seawater. So potassium actually being utilized by uh, coral, algae, basically a lot of things is a fertilizer. So uh, it's also responsible for some of the pretty color that Acropora shows, like purple, pink. And yep. that actually, uh, both in scientific and uh, literature, as well as in the hobby observation. So uh, potassium, iodine, amino acid. Uh, sometimes I drop in some uh, nitrate to keep my core happy. That's pretty much of it. And now we're going to come to trace element. I always tell this story. I even bought a prop of it. This is a piece of rock. Try to imagine this. I get kidnapped by the alien and locked in a glass cage. And they just throw me a rock. I said, what the? What does this do? And the alien told me, we found this rock at your home, in your backyard. That must benefit you. That's your trace element. You should benefit from this. Now, here's the thing. There's uh, many, many trace elements. For example, I studied something that a ICP test test. Um, they're there in the seawater. Many of them is just being in the Earth's system, in the water. It, a trace element happened to be in the water does not mean it actually do anything to the coral or benefit the coral. And for a matter of fact, when trace elements become elevated, it becomes toxic because the many trace elements actually have heavy, heavy metals. Now, to those trace, trace elements, it, uh, you need to be, uh, there's several criteria need to be uh, uh, fulfilled. First, trace element, this particular trace element has to be proven to have some biological effect on coral, hopefully beneficial. And this kind of thing, has to be uh, come from scientific study. It's not like say, okay, I dose a, a, a dummy in a bottle of something, my core looks better. No, this is not good enough. It has to be scientifically proven that your trace element ABC actually do something. Mm. And second thing is how much uh, is good. For example, too much is not good trace element like chromium. So when you have elevated chromium and then you're actually hurting your coral. Uh, another example is copper. So uh, actually copper is a very, very essential trace element in the seawater because that uh, actually invertebrate, marine invertebrate, they utilize copper like our, our blood utilizing iron. So that's why our blood is red because that it binds into iron and then we have a uh, same thing happened to copper. Copper is the iron in the ocean. But when you have too much copper, it's bad. Why is that? It's, the reason is that in natural seawater, copper is a tiny, tiny amount. It's so trace amount. So marine invertebrate develop a way to take up as much copper as possible. There is no stopping mechanism. Whatever copper available, they will keep taking, taking, mm -hmm. taking. And that's why when you dose too much copper, they just choke themselves to death. That's what they're overtaking, get a poisoning. That's how actually how the copper is working on your uh, ache or whatever, or whatever treatment they're doing is because this marine in, uh, invertebrate, they cannot stop taking copper. It's like drug to them until they overdose and die. So that is what it is. But you cannot without copper because without copper and that uh, everybody suffer. So that is why in your soul mix, there's copper. <laughs> but when you have too much copper, it kills your coral. Now uh, that comes to the question is that how much is good enough? How much is not good, too much? So we need this data. Without this data, you better just leave it alone. Another thing is that how accurate we can test these elements. Yeah, I was gonna, I was gonna ask you ICP testing, yeah. like how, uh, how much do you okay. lean on ICP tests? Uh, I probably just fall over on the ground, hit my head and bruise all over. <laughs> well, ICP is a great technology, seriously. Just like Jake Adam, I'm a big fan of Jake. So maybe, yeah. So I, um, I uh, one time I watched your show. He mentioned something like that that ICP company should give some kind of uh, certification. I think it's very important. And I also watch another show that uh, I think you and Tidal Garden about that uh, mislabeled vial come back with the ICP number totally different. Yeah. Uh, this is one thing is about that how the ICP test is carried out. 
on how the instrument is calibrated, how the internal standard was being done. Uh, let me give you one uh, uh, piece of data to accurately analyze salt water for the trace element. First, professionally done, they have to the dissolve the sample first, basically removing majority of the sodium chloride, which the sodium peak is basically overlapping everybody. They have to dissolve it first, and then they're going to analyze it. And also they need to use uh, multiple internal standard and professionally, it costs you four to $5,000 to make one accurate seawater analysis. That's enough set mm. of over there. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. So uh, that back to the trace element, if we do not know what it does, if we do not know how much is too much, how much is good, and we don't have an accurate message to, to uh, accurate enough to test uh, how much we dose in real time, not waiting for a week or two. And then, yes, you feel free to dose that trace element. Anything else, I will say just that piece of rock on my hand. <laughs> no different than this piece of rock. And then one day, maybe the, the aliens ICP machine, they call for interstellar collecting some piece of whatever, and just to throw 100 piece of rock at me in my cage because the ICP cannot differentiate one rock versus 100 rock. So now, really screw, man. <laughs> that same thing happened to this dosing. If you do not know how much is needed, if you do not know and how much is too much, and then you don't have an accurate, reliable method to test uh, in real time about how much you actually in your water, so you much better just do water change. Yeah, you know, it's, it's interesting because um, when I first got into the reef keeping hobby, I was not um, numbers oriented at all in terms of testing and, and what have you. I never measured phosphate. I never measured magnesium. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I just measured yep. alkalinity, calcium, and uh, nitrate for the most part, and salinity, and I kept uh, tabs of my temperature and all that stuff. But, um, yep. you know, now with all the... Um, the testing available, ICP testing, and there's a lot of data out there and you could really be very, mm -hmm. um, you know, you could be very reactive in terms of that data and making changes to the system. You know, I'll give you an example. I, um, I had been testing my, um, and this is a big issue, I think, in terms of phosphate test kits. You know, they're not very accurate, right? The, uh, the hobby grade yep. test mm -hmm. kits, it's, it's very tough to kind of get a read on them. I've got a Milwaukee, um, I forget the uh, the model number. It's it's uh, it's 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 kind of like a higher grade, um, you know, hobby grade test kit that uh, that I've been utilizing. And you know, I I had for for a few weeks in a row, I test once a week. I had been getting like zero, you know, on that uh, on that test kit. So I was like, oh, okay, you know, usually I'll wait like two or three weeks before I react to something where I'm getting zero zero zero, mm -hmm. and I'm like, all right, well, I don't want zero phosphate, but my corals look fine, you know. So uh, I reacted and started dosing a lot more phosphate than I had been. And then, um, mm -hmm. you know, I don't know if this is a coincidence, and I know what you just said in terms of before about, um, you know, high phosphate levels being actually not a bad thing. But, um, you know, the one thing I noticed is one of my um, beautiful, bright pink millies overnight browned out on me. So, you know, was that because of the, uh, the, the, you know, the increased phosphate dosing? I don't, I don't know. But I think it's an example of, um, you know, kind of reacting to a test that you're getting from a test kit about phosphate. Mm -hmm. And I think that's something that I probably wouldn't have done years ago. But I, I you know, I'm um, in terms of my modern reef keeping habits, that's stuff that I have been doing. I, I, I don't try to react quickly, but I, I do react if I uh, if I see something on a test kit like that. So. You know, I, I guess my question to you is that um, how reactive should people be based on what they're seeing from their test kits? You know, if the phosphate test kits out there are not terribly accurate and there are some issues with some of the elements being measured with the ICP tests, you know, what, what's mm -hmm. a reef keeper to do? Uh, so my philosophy is that if your tank looks good, don't do anything. <laughs> yeah. So just ignore the test kit, except alkalinity. Okay, you cannot ignore alkalinity. Um, so for phosphate and nitrate, here's another uh, thing about them. Is the phosphate we actually can test does not representing the total phosphate uh, level in our tank. And there's a lot of organic 
uh, bound phosphate that is not testable by the test kit by various methods that, uh, that the coral still takes in. That means the coral is still getting phosphate. So uh, despite that your test kit is showing zero. So the idea of it is that if your coral looks good, your fish is healthy, don't do anything. There's no reason to react to that. And uh, by blindly dumping in a lot of things or reactive to a test kit, except alkalinity again. <laughs> and then, um, so I would just sit back, relax, enjoy the tank. And also in that case, if, if you find out your phosphate and nitrate is pretty low, like zero, the best way to do it is go to your local market uh, basket. Well, this is what happened in, in this area. Your local grocery store and grab some raw salmon, raw tuna, raw shrimp, soak them in uh, tap water to clean up the phosphate on them because all this organic seafood is coated with phosphate yeah. to, re to, to prevent bacterial growth. And then blend your seafood into mush and put it in the freezer and give your coral and fish some treats. And then your phosphate bounce back and your nitrate bounce back. And uh, more importantly, you're actually feeding them some wholesome food instead of just inorganic phosphate. So um, that, that, that's how I, I look at it, is that uh, they're all living things. And um, uh, by looking at a coral, yeah, if they're doing fine for phosphate, no, not such a big deal. Yeah, you know, I, uh, Chris Mickley just joined us uh, from ACI. Hey, what's up there, Chris? And um, Hi, Chris. And, and um, yeah, because I think he and I use the, uh, the same Milwaukee uh, phosphate uh, test kit. And, and, and Chris was telling me in his experience that, you know, versus ICP testing, that that Milwaukee uh, kit, let me see if I get this right, is um, probably point, point zero 0.05 to point one five or point one seven something like that, I think is what Chris told me, um, uh, lower than, than what uh, the ICP test will uh, really show. So if you're getting like a zero then you could, in, in reality, be getting like a 0.1 uh, phosphate on, on that test kit. So I don't know. It, it's, it's a little frustrating to me in terms of, you know, why can't we get a, uh, a reliable measure of phosphate in the hobby? And I know it's, it's, a, uh, it's something that's very, very difficult to measure because, like you said, there's, there's more phosphate than, um, than what those test kits can, can measure. It's, it, it just seems like, you know, there's, there's all these uh, innovations in the hobby. Why can't, uh, why can't somebody come up with a reliable phosphate test kit? <laughs> I think that, uh, first of all, uh, I think that for 0 0.05 or 0 0.01 ppm uh, difference is not really a difference. You're absolutely right. And uh, with the error that, uh, or even including ICP, and that number is not absolute. And when you test in zero, you may have, may have a 0 0.1, so uh, my point of view is that just totally ignore it. Basically, uh, what think about what exactly the phosphate do to your reef tank as a hobby or as an aquaculture people, what does that do? What harm does it do? Why do you want to so desperately remove it? Or why do you even care? So uh, the idea is that you know, if you have a lot of hair algae, that probably is not just because you're phosphate. There, there may be a lot of other, uh, other things, other impurity, especially organic impurity. Those are not testable by any uh, commercial available test kit, not testable by ICP for the, um, uh, those elements. There is a Trident that actually have organic ICP or something like that. Uh, I, I don't know what exactly they are, I never use it. Uh, uh, but I think that is a good approach, to, the way to testing organic contents. Um, so there is a, so much impurity actually in organic form that actually feeding your algae, feeding your dino, feeding your silo, your phosphate test kit, just uh, showing the tips of iceberg. So why not just uh, totally ignore this tips of iceberg? As long as your, your core looks fine, yeah, don't worry about it. Keep on your water change. Your water change is a good way to remove uh, impurity, especially in organic form, especially the one that you cannot test. That is another important thing about water change. They remove those organic impurity, pollutants, and also especially some compounds generated by coral for uh, biological warfare. Basically, it's to suppress other coral, like Garnipora, for example, like that. Uh, those compounds are not testable by any test kit. So the, the best way or the only way to do it, to remove them, water change. 
So just do your wallet change, ignore the 0.1% or uh, zero one PPM difference about your false hit, false pay test. Uh, detritus. Yeah, you mentioned that you like to yep. keep detritus in your sumps and all that stuff. Um, yep. You know, mm-hmm. The general reef keepers, should, should they be um, you know, more diligent in terms of removing detritus from their systems? Uh, that is really hard to say. Uh, at the beginning, yeah, remove them because there's uh, a source for this um, uh, organic pollution as well. Uh, because when your biological filtration is not fully mature and that is where that mechanical filtration or uh, do whatever you, you can to remove them, yeah, that and also uh, the detritus accumulated in the sum is quite different than accumulating in a tank. So, well, and uh, with the modern wave maker, I don't think there's really an issue by detritus uh, accumulating in the tank because uh, it's very hard for them to accumulate when they have all the wave action. Going yeah, you've through. got a lot of flow in your tanks. I know. Um, oh, yeah. Uh, I mean, yeah, it, 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 it's like a washing machine. In, inside your tanks there. Oh yeah, <laughs> uh, Dong. Um, so um, uh, I see Skinner JW. Hey Keith, the Hanna ULR isn't good in your opinion. I've um, I've used the uh, the Hanna checkers for phosphate, and um, I've had it, it, I've had kind of a frustrating experience with those. I'm not sure how uh, how accurate they are. I've um, I've been advised um, to try the the Hatch phosphate uh, test kit. Oh. So I'm yeah, gonna, that's uh, a good one. I'm gonna uh, Chris Wood gave me uh, gave me uh, the uh, the tip on that one. So I think it's like eight weeks before they're uh, you know you can get one of those things. But uh, I put my uh, I put my order in, so we'll see. But mm-hmm. I also agree with uh, with Chris at ACI. I think um, ICP will give the total phosphate. So that's that's something that um, I'll probably uh, lean on. Um, more so versus uh, what I'm getting with my Milwaukee test kit. So, Dong, uh, what do you think about uh, UV sterilizers? So you're uh, you're not running mechanical filtration. You like uh, mm-hmm. detritus in your systems there, and and um, so it, you know you keep a dirty tanks, right? I mean, you yep. have high uh, phosphates, and and you, you, well, you're doing what you can to keep the nitrates high. What about uh, UV? Do you think UV is beneficial for a reef tank? Uh, UV can kill anything that can pass through it. It all depends on what you're trying to control. So the organism you want to control, um, it must have the ability to pass through the UV. For example, if you have some bugs or parasites you want to kill, and those bugs and parasites are living on a rock or living on coral. You're not going to get them. And in, in that case, that UV sterilizer will not do anything. What, what about, you know, I, I run UVs on my systems and... Um, you know, I think that um, the theory in terms of running UV is that there are certain pathogens that could impact uh, coral health and that having a UV will uh, will help kind of nip that stuff in the bud. So um, what, what do you think about that? Do you think that's that's a legit reason to run UV or do you think UV could be detrimental to the good guy bacteria that are in our uh, reef tanks? Oh, good question. This is a very, very good point that uh, you, you brought up. First of all, let's look at the bacteria. Um, there's very little understanding from scientific literature about what is the good guy, what is the bad guy. And there's so many types of them in there. And also the bacteria living on the coral is quite different from the bacteria living on the water column and they serve different purpose. For example, there's a study found that uh, the bacteria live on Acropora. And Acropora actually be able to manipulate the bacteria on the skin as well as the adjacent water in order to do the uh, feeding on bacteria and use the bacteria to fight off other bacteria, um, all that kind of thing. So coral is very smart to utilize bacteria, the same as human. For example, we have tons of bacteria um, in us that are doing a lot of beneficial job. But now here comes an- another important thing. Good bacteria can turn bad when they're overpopulated or some good bacteria gets too low in concentration, some other bacteria take over and causing harm. So all the bacteria thing is basically still in a black box. Even on a human science part, a human uh, pharmaceutical and the bacteria, yeah, uh, the, how the bacteria play important role, how exactly they're doing thing, there's still lots of ground to explore. It's not very clear, but marine, 
we're talking about really, really the dark age, even before the dark age, even doesn't even Earth doesn't exist that dark age or in the beginning of the Big Bang, that kind of uh, stage. Yep. So, but more and more uh, science um, funding, uh, scientific studies and done on that, we get a better picture about how bacteria, bacteria uh, affect the coral, affect all the organism. And for example, some bacteria is good for your agropora, probably not very good for your multipora, but just, just uh, generally speaking, or not very good on other bacteria. So basically, bacteria is still uh, like a prehistoric uh, age with so little understanding, but it's very promising. And to manipulate the bacteria, we are not there yet, far from it. Um, so in terms of the UV sterilizer, they definitely can kill some bacteria, but uh, many hobby grade UV sterilizer are not strong enough. They are not effective. And uh, maybe they have some negative impact on, on those cocoa pods, a little uh, living uh, critters that fit on uh, the, the coral actually can eat as food. Well, I do not run a UV sterilizer. Primarily because that that's one extra uh, electrical outlet I need to use. <laughs> <laughs> one extra thing can. What if you had? What if you had? What if you had the extra outlets there, Don? I will not. Run no. it. The reason for that is that a UV sterilizer is a very risky device. What it does is your UV ball in there and the glass jacket and the seal to prevent your water get into mm. that. So. It's basically like a ticking time bomb. My uh, one of my and glass, one of my glass yeah. sleeves was uh, cracked. Oh yeah, yeah. When the water get in, water didn't get in, and you're nuking your tank. Water didn't get in. Oh, that's yeah. good. Yeah. Yep. Yep. That's that's a that's a good thing. But if water get into that, uh, you're probably t talking about a reboot number three. <laughs> so this is interesting, Chris uh, from ACI. Yeah, is like we we're close to doing no water changes in our farm tanks. We'll have to talk about that, Chris, when you're on the show. Have mm -hmm. to get some uh, get some uh, rationale behind that. Uh, I've seen you mention that before. But um, all right, so no no UV. So, um, Don, you and I were talking about this before the live stream in terms of uh, bacteria dosing. So um, you, you've said that, that it is a bit of a black box, and, and uh, I've had Dr. Eli uh, Meyer on from uh, Aquabiomics. He's going to be coming on again in, in, in a couple of weeks. So they do um, bacteria testing to uh, to kind of get a handle in terms of the, 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 the types of bacteria that you have and the, how diverse of a bacteria population you do have in your tanks. So you could even um, test for pests like, uh, you know, flatworms and, and um, aptasia and, and things like that. What, um, what are your thoughts in terms of bacteria um, needing to dose bacteria to a reef tank? A lot of us do that because we believe it is beneficial. But um, what are your thoughts? Are you a, a bacteria doser or do you um, not dose bacteria? Uh, well, I do not dose bacteria. Uh, what uh, this bacteria testing is, a, uh, is an interesting thing. It's something new, something uh, uh, very promising in the future. So I think it's a good way to start to uh, let us to understand how bacteria and what kinds of bacteria and also that what's the population of them, how, how, uh, how they affect the coral uh, in a reef tank. But right now, the information generated from that probably is a little bit difficult to utilize how to improve our tank. Uh, back to bacterial dosing. Actually, in general, I think bacterial dosing is not a bad thing. Um, I do not do it because that all this mature system, I probably have more bacteria than I need. <laughs> <laughs> so bacteria does several things, uh, uh, regardless uh, uh, of what kind of bacteria in general speaking. So one thing is that uh, coral, especially like Acropora, they do consume bacteria as food source. So they probably does, does not differentiate what type of bacteria they actually encounter as long as edible, they just grab it. So because they're in the do, ocean, do, that's what they do. Do we know what bacteria the corals are dosing? Do we have that kind of information at this point or no? I don't think so. So um, I don't So then how do these companies, know. you know, then I guess my question to um, the companies that are making these products is like, how do they know what to put in there? And uh, I think a lot of them are not even putting, you know, the strains of bacteria that, that are in their bottles, which is um, a little 
you know, distressing. But go ahead. Okay. So now, first of all, that uh, um, the most bacterial product I see on the market, they probably more uh, gravitated toward uh, the nitrification bacteria. And, right, uh, right. Those, yeah, right. Right. We're talking about so, dosing bacteria to a mature reef mm -hmm. tank, not not yep. a, not a new, uh, no, no, yeah, not a new reef tank. Yep. So on a mature reef tank, basically those bacteria probably won't do much to uh, enrich your bacterial culture, um, but they do floating around in your coral yield, and also they do multiply and take out some of the organic impurities. So I don't think there's a downside for it. It's just that the question is that, is it really necessary to do that? Uh, how much impact you can have is highly questionable. And also how pure those bacterial culture is. Actually, that is my biggest concern. So uh, to isolate certain strains of bacteria as what they said on the label is not really that uh, trivial. It's not really that um, cost effective. That's, that's how much I want to say is that Basically, I will look at a bacterial product. I grab off a store shelf, which is sitting on God knows what kind of temperature, what kind of thing they're exposed <laughs> to. I say, okay, look at this and uh, some organic food for my coral. But should I spend a 20 buck for it? Hell no. No, sorry. No, I'm not <laughs> going to do it. But for a new tank, yeah, it's beneficial because that uh, some of the uh, denitrification bacteria, you definitely make them establish quicker. But keep in mind, all these bacteria, they will multiply so rapid in your tank. They, for example, they, some of them multiply like uh, they double the colony size in four to eight hours. Mm. So in that case, that for a uh, new hobbyist, you can just buy one bottle and dump it in. And that's pretty much it. The more bottle you buy doesn't buy you too much benefit, seriously. And uh, for mature reef tank, if I feel generous, I want to give my Acropora some uh, a nice dinner, a twenty dollar dinner. I just pour in bacteria in, but I normally don't do that. <laughs> if you do the amino acids, yes. So uh, that's entirely different. <laughs> so uh, we've been kind of skirting around this uh, this uh, pH, right? And um, yep. mm -hmm. you and I have talked about this in terms of you're not you're not uh, totally. Um, um, an advocate of like chasing the pH. You, you do think pH is important, right? But you want to talk about your opinions about pH and, and you know, optimal ranges and, and why you think that um, maybe pH is not the thing you should focus on solely or not solely, but uh, lean heavily on. Yep. Uh, so let's talk, uh, uh, try to give a, a, a understanding about how, what exactly the pH and alkalinity, what ex actually the pH is, quite um, heavily associated with the alkalinity, but it's not linear. The equation is like one side, the other of a 10 something parameter on the other side. So, so let's don't go uh, into that part, but uh, what's important actually uh, in my point of view, for my research is that the most important thing is still the alkalinity. And is the pH is just an indicator. It just uh, come along for the show. It, the absolute number for a pH may not be as important as a hobbyist. Maybe it's important for environmental scientists about talk about the ocean acidification or that kind of thing. It may be important to them, but it's less important uh, from my point of view as, um, uh, as a hobbyist, hobbyist in our tank. So uh, to understand pH, actually, uh, we need to talk about alkalinity. That is really what's important. And also I will show you how uh, the process of the when coral take in alkalinity for the utilization, how the pH change. So uh, here I have is a paper pub published by Nature. Uh, it published in uh, 2015. So uh, Nature is the holy grail of scientific publication. Nature. King of the king. Yep, Nature. Okay. Now, uh, we talk about uh, in this paper actually has a very nice graph and talk about how this uh, alkalinity uh, affect the coral, how the coral utilize alkalinity, which is very important to bring to another important thing is uh, we always believe in this one-to-one uh, -one ratio dosing, uh, alkalinity calcium. Yeah. It's not true. 
coral actually consume more alkalinity than calcium, which had, this question has been asking by people uh, from various, uh, like uh, reef to reef, bots and reefer, people do observe that it seems to use a little dose a little bit more alkalinity than calcium. But besides the test kit error, because our calcium test kit has like 10 to 15% error, that means that 420 ppm versus 400 ppm probably is not, it's not a big difference. And a small amount of change uh, may not be picked up by our hobby grade calcium test kit, including the HANA test kit. So, uh, but the alkalinity, here, here is this. Um, seawater, the biggest characteristic of seawater is a gigantic buffer. A buffer means that the seawater can resist pH change. So what we can see is that alkalinity actually against pH. Alkalinity is, is there to hold the pH steady within certain range. That is what alkalinity is. But what exactly is alkalinity? Alkalinity, uh, basically, it composed of, uh, well, there's so many little greedy details, we just forget them all. Because anything that less than 5% can be ignored. Alkalinity majority is a, a three component, carbon dioxide, bicarbonate, and carbonate. Basically, uh, it's just these three forms. Uh, in a reef tank, normally the pH is around 7.9 to 8.2. At this kind of pH, we can uh, safely assume, actually uh, the, also the research show, the carbon dioxide content is extremely low. But majority of the carbon, uh, carbonate, actually is a bicarbonate, HCO3 uh, minus. So that's a bicarbonate. That actually is the baking soda. That's part of the, the baking soda minus soda. The, the, so that's baking soda. We're getting, so, you're giving us uh, a chemistry uh, lesson here, Dong. Yeah, so uh, the, the bottom line is that we can just uh, thinking about alkalinity is baking soda. Alkalinity representing baking soda. But we cannot test the bicarbonate uh, accurately just by bicarbonate alone. So we use the alkalinity or we can we should call it total alkalinity as a surrogate to uh, reflect how much bicarbonate we have in our tank. And the bicarbonate is the alkalinity, also is the major component of the buffering system, is the one that prevents your pH swing too much. For example, when when the base add into your tank, like uh Kawasa, and then the bicarbonate will transform into carbonate maintain your pH not going to uh, not swing up too high. That is how the buffering system works. By pushing the seawater out of bound, like if you push to 8.6, 8.7, you're basically breaking the buffer. That's what it is. Pushing the pH that uh, high, yeah. Yep. So uh, in terms of how the coral utilize bicarbonate. So because that uh, during the evolution about all these millions of year evolution, what coral see as a carbon source in the seawater is bicarbonate. That means that your coral is utilizing baking soda, not anything else for the carbon source, in a, just in a very rough term, just like that. Bicarbonate is the only one they use. Ignore the carbon dioxide, ignore the carbonate. So now how it does a coral polyp on the surface, and there's something called transporter. A transporter like a taxi driver, a Uber driver, transporting the bicarbonate from outside of the coral in the water going inside. And now here's an interesting thing. So in general, the seawater pH is 8.2. But when they reach inside the coral, the pH is 7.4, okay? Mm. And then they, the uh, part of the carbonate, uh, the, the bicarbonate uh, will go into the calcium calcification, forming the skeleton, and part of it actually biologically store up and then uh, for later use and for, for your photosynthesis and also from releasing back uh, as a carbonate form to form the coral skeleton. So the, the bottom line is that uh, coral utilizes bicarbonate. It does not utilize pH, does not utilize proton. That's what the pH level is. They utilize bicarbonate and bicarbonate, and that's it. And they transported the bicarbonate the taxi driver will bury it from outside the water, which has pH 8.2, inside the coral, pH 7.4. Now, okay, and then 
they convert it back into uh, uh, the, the carbonate form at the site of the calcification. At that pH, it's around 8.9. But keep in mind, all these internal pH are internally controlled. Nothing to do with outside water. So there's always this hypothesis saying that, oh, you're high pH, then uh, you get a better calcification. Yeah, I see a lot of paper talk about it, but show me the proof. There is, I have yet to see a laboratory setting that uh, how this pH of external pH affect the calcification. Maybe, maybe not, but you just need this proof there. But uh, on the other hand is that, uh, how does Kawasa work? It works wonder, it's great thing to those. What it does, it actually generating bicarbonate, generating your baking soda, your alkalinity for you. That's what Kawasa does. The major function, the only function of it is not raise the pH, is converting, the, uh, uh, it generating bicarbonate in your water. How it does is that we exposed to the, the atmosphere, there's basically a limit supply of carbon dioxide. And then R10 is alkaline, is about 7.9 to 8.2. So the carbon dioxide actually get into the water. And then because the water is kind of basic, they are capturing the carbon dioxide, turn into bicarbonate. And then that forms the alkalinity, which you utilize by your coral. So basically when you're adding uh, more uh, cold water, cold water is a calcium hydroxide, is a base. Uh, what it does is that not only, well, the good part is that you're also supplementing calcium, that's a good part, but for the carbonate part and for the pH part, what it does is act as a base, make your water more basic. So the, the carbon dioxide comes in and then convert it into bicarbonate, you, you utilize by coral, you put in more cow water and more carbon dioxide go in and that's how you get your alkalinity up. That is how cow water works. It's not about pushing the pH, it's by taking converting CO2, the carbon dioxide into bicarbonate that is why if you look at Randy's uh, the recipe about the dosing, uh, he can use uh, one of his recipe actually using sodium hydroxide. That is exactly the same method. It basically make your water more basic. And then the carbon dioxide gets in and reacting with this base and form your bicarbonate. So by the end of the day, bicarbonate is the king. Is what it matters. It, pH, it just... Uh, come along for the show. So uh, that is how the cut water dosing works. And uh, you can either do calcium reactor, you can do two part dosing, you can do cut water. Cut water has a lot of benefit to it. And uh, that definitely, it, it, uh, I think that like ACI, like Chris, I think there's a great thing on a, on a commercial scale because it's simple and it's uh, uh, easy. Uh, that is the way to go. So that, that's a great thing. And Cutwasser was discovered so many years ago, and uh, right now he is like coming back. Well, so, a good thing always. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's it's kind of trendy. <laughs> uh, so Chris did did mention earlier in the chat that pH of an eight point three makes a world of difference in terms of alkalinity uh, stability. Agree? Disagree? Uh, what kind of stability uh, it is? Uh, yes, I do not think that uh, you, if you talk about the alkalinity stability. I don't think so. Because that if you look at the Great Barrier Reef, 7.9 to 8.2. So, and the, the pH basically, I don't think is even in the picture about the stability. For matter of fact, pushing the pH too high uh, is creating instability. Because that is a buffering system. You try to pull it back. You try to pull the pH down uh, from this, uh, the outer bound, but then you keep pumping in more, more base and you're basically trying to break the buffer. So that actually created more up and down and creating more instability. So, um, all right, so what I'm hearing from you is that you're not chasing pH. You, you, know, you, yep. you believe pH is important, but you're more focused on- Yeah, it is important. You're, you're more focused on the, uh, the alkalinity. What, um, what alkalinity range are you, um, do you seek a certain range or does your systems just kind of settle in within a certain range? That's a very great question. That's a good question. So alkalinity actually is a buffering capacity. It's not an element. So alkalinity, uh, when you have sufficient amount of uh, alkalinity level, just means that you have a uh, sufficient amount of uh, bicarbonate, sufficient amount of baking soda available for your coral. 
So for alkalinity, uh, I keep my alkalinity around uh, eight, uh, around eight, sometimes around nine. So alkalinity, as long as it is between seven to eleven, by the convenience store, it really makes not much difference. Seriously, I uh, I remember I read an article about uh, the study of alkalinity versus aquaporous growth. It basically is really not much difference at all. So if you drop below seven, that actually will create stability issue because the, your system, uh, the, the, the bicarbonate content is so low and then the buffering capacity actually drop. So your stability of, uh, in your tank actually lower. Um, and of course that at the same time, there, there are a smaller amount of bicarbonate carbonate available to the coral. So uh, from that study, I, I, I read, it basically make not much difference at all. And now, and people, uh, I get this question from people is saying that, well, high alkalinity kill your coral. I don't think so. So uh, how do we look at this? Uh, and Don, just, just so people yeah. know, I'm showing the uh, clip of your systems again, just so people oh, okay. can, uh, that might have missed yep. it before or can, can see your uh, beautiful uh, animals. <laughs> go ahead. Thank you. Yeah, go ahead. Okay. So um, there is uh, observation. That's absolutely true. Is when your tank is not doing well, your coral are looking a little bit uh, not doing well, and then your alkalinity starts to rise up. But this is always a, a question about the horse and the cart. So uh, for people who keep SPS, I think majority of us uh, will have a dosing system. Either it's a cut washer, or it's calcium reactor, or it's a two-part dosing. That means that dosing system is constantly pumping in alkalinity and calcium, regardless the consumption of the coral. So for whatever reason that caused the coral to suffer or you are not doing well, so they reduce their consumption. They grow slower or they stop growing altogether. So the, the consumption of alkalinity and calcium drops, but then you're still pumping in, continuously pumping in the same ratio of your alkalinity and calcium. So on your test kit, you can see your alkalinity start to rise. And then your coral not looking very hot. So that is uh, the, the result, the reason is that because your coral is not very hot to begin with, that's why they uh, consume less of alkalinity. And then your dosing equipment are still pumping in alkalinity. And then you see the alkalinity spike. So this is the sequence of event that happened. But uh, on the other hand, if you just walk in and test alkalinity, oh my God, it's 16. And my coral look really not doing well. Mm. And they'll say, oh, there must be a high alkalinity kill my coral. No, that's not the case. It's the other way around. So basically, sometimes that people uh, will ask me, oh, I, I accidentally, my dosing pump malfunction, I just, my alkalinity is 16 right now. What should I do? Well, do as much water change as possible to drop it down and sit back, relax. Really not much, uh, you won't do too much harm. Seriously. So you're saying, you're, you're basically kind of debunking a, um, a, um, a something that I, I thought was um, pretty well known in the hobby, that alk swings are not necessarily... A, a, a thing that can impact coral health? Not necessarily. Right. Uh, but actually, uh, sometimes large pH swing, that can impact coral health. Uh, but we are talking about pretty big. For example, I like swing from 7.4 lower and suddenly uh, uh, pass through the, the like 8.6, something like that. That actually can irritate coral quite greatly, but not the alkalinity. Because, well, uh, the the... Important thing is alkalinity is a buffering capacity. It's not a single element. It's not uh, some kind of thing by itself that can affect your coral's health. So when your alkalinity gradually uh, drop down to below seven, your coral is perfectly fine. They just uh, uh, calcify less, grow slow, they're perfectly fine. I have a friend who has a uh, green slimer growing out of the water. And if really I had that happen to me. Yeah. And and the things that I test is alkalinity, six. Six. And that's what it is, six. And yeah. all the core looks perfectly healthy. No problem. It, it just doesn't grow as fast. Right. And I have, I see people actually, uh, there's a guy actually uh, grow beautiful SPS, 
and he said his alkalinity is 10. But then it turns out to be a 40 meter, and his alkalinity is 14 for all, yeah. this, all these years. And his tank is beautiful. He, it was going on it's for all really, those years. He was uh, looking at bad uh, bad tests there. Oh, boy. Hey, yep, Remy, yep. Uh, Remy from Bahama Lama Coral, <laughs> thanks, man, for the, uh, for the super chat. Great info, guys. Appreciate that, Remy. Looking forward to your uh, rebirth there on your channel. Um, all right, so, Don, a, a, a couple of things. Um, we haven't even talked about lighting, and I, I've, I've seen a couple of people uh, mention lighting and, and asking, okay. like, what you have in terms of lighting. You want to talk about your uh, thoughts on lighting and, and what you're currently using? And Okay. Yeah, I'll tee that up for uh, you. You see this tank here? Uh is led by two mass spec racer, first generation. <laughs> That's when it just come out, like what, 14, 13 years ago? Yeah. And then we have some of the rebreeders and LED bar. Uh, in this mass spec racer, there's one thing people can tell immediately, there's no red, no green, because they were made, predated this red and green craziness. Hmm. Um, yeah, in terms of lighting, I'm actually, in my heart, deep down, I'm a halide guy. But my uh, electricity bill won't agree with that. <laughs> and my temperature in the room won't agree with yeah. that. So I used to have about uh, all 250 watt radium metal halide all over. Yeah. Uh, I have uh, currently have about 12 system here and about 2,000 gallon. And then uh, you can imagine how many radium metal halide there. So uh, the room is over 90 degrees yeah, <laughs> in wow. the winter. There you go. So that means that the winter time, they have to open the door or whatever, open the window to cool it down. So that is the important thing that that's, uh, I have to switch. And then the thing is that one time I was testing a metal halide and one piece of paper accidentally dropped on the bulb and the paper ignited. So that what triggers me. Oh my goodness. This is really a, is a safety hazard waiting to happen. So what happened if yeah, I'm not home, the piece of paper, whatever, or fly over yeah. to metal halide. So that is just, well, it's just uh, uh, icing on the cake, that kind of whatever you want to call it. So that is why I have to look for alternative. Uh, remember when I just found Boston Reefer? I went to the, my first Boston Reefer meeting. What people are talking about, hey, man, I got power compact. <laughs> oh, that's a, that's a, that is the most advanced thing. And it will make those people who have VHO say, oh, we still have VHO. Oh no, now we have power compact. <laughs> yeah, and then comes the metal halide and, and we talk about, oh, do you get the, the, the newest, uh, those aquamatic double MD, yeah. DE yeah. metal halide? Yeah, and for a matter of fact, I still have one sitting in the corner <laughs> for the, the aquamatic double ended 250 watt metal yeah. halide with the famous Phoenix 14K box. There you go. The, yeah, the metal halide is unreplaceable. That's my, well, of course, I have to make do with something else. So because on the metal halide, and the coral definitely behave differently. So you can see it from the growth. So actually the best growth I ever experienced uh, for the past, God knows how many years, start from 2004, uh, is under metal halide. So uh, that is why I, I work with uh, LED manufacturers and I'm very into lighting. 2015, I come up with this contra contraption. That is pretty long, uh, uh, a long time ago when everybody looking at a black box. Well, look at this uh, prototype. Uh, passive cooling, no fan. So this thing drop into the water, no big deal. Drive it, hose it down, still working. How I did with this thing is that, well, you can see this is a grid. It's like 12 inch by 12 inch panel. Actually kind of remind me that the ATI is dragon. Mm -hmm. All the Newton sky yeah. minus the 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 fan yeah. to take his thing. This thing, uh, how I uh, get this thing done is that I work with LED manufacturer. I give them a radium twenty k metal halide. You, you said mimic <laughs> mimic that spectrum. Yeah, maybe the spectrum and the spread with uh, uh so mm -hmm. what do you call it the 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 Lumin Max fixture whatever thing. So they come up with this thing. So basically, uh, what surprised me when I just got this light back, so many green on it, lots of lots of green LED. That is actually what actually uh, uh, kind of true for the on on the the radium twenty uh, k bulb. Um, okay, now I have this prototype, but 
they used to have a frosted lens here. I just re remove it somewhere. Uh, my cat probably took it away. Uh, so uh, <laughs> it has a frosted lens. So basically, it's a um, uh, primitive uh, ATI strategy. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> Back in uh, 2015. Okay. So my idea is that is uh, metal halide. First of all, metal halide is not a point source, point source light. We found the refractor. Yeah, it may be. But with the refractor, absolutely not a point source light. So it's not a castle. So that's very important. So I do not know what castle mimicking uh, something very original, but absolutely not metal halide. So uh, for coral, uh, at that time, I remember when I gave a talk on the Boston River Society. At that time, everybody talked about color blending. Uh, the color come out from the light has to be absolutely uniform. I actually show a test of an AI uh, Hydra. Well, I, I was a Hydra guy uh, before, uh, after I found that metal halide was so um, overwhelming, yeah. especially for my heart and for, uh, for yeah. the heat, electricity bill. Uh, then I go to, I get uh, the first metal, uh, actually a good LED light actually is uh, AI, uh, what do you call it? The Soul Blue, is that what it is? AI Soul. I got a pair of AI Soul from Boston Reefer, used, inexpensive. This is an experiment. Yeah. I put it on a 120 gallon tank. It used to have two giant uh, single-ended radium ball, two of them on it, 120. I put them on, turn them on. I'm speechless. I start to see the color I never see before. Really? Oh yeah, it's day and night different. And then, especially when see, uh, it's controllable, when, when the blue light comes on, oh my God. Yeah, right, the fluorescence. Now, go ahead. No, go, yeah, go <laughs> ahead, I, 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 I hear you. Okay. So I uh, start with AI so, and then go to the Hydra. Actually, there's a Vega in, in between. I skip that step. Uh, then the, now become much more programmable, and then the, the color even better. But at that time, then we were thinking about, does this red light really matter? Is the green light really matter? By working with LED manufacturer, uh, I know, uh, uh, what they say, the, the white LED actually is a full spectrum LED. That is, you have the green and red spectrum in there. The green and red just come in for the show. Because for some bizarre reason, on Reef Central at the time, people thinking about, talking about, if the LED does not have red and green, it's not full spectrum, which is totally false. But somehow it turned out to be a marketing opportunity that everybody is jamming in red and green there. But uh, manufacturer understand the red and green just coming for the show. For example, if you look at a, um, uh, AI light, how much wattage this green and red actually occupy? Very small amount. So the majority of the power is go to the blue, violet, UV, and white. The red and green basically just come along for the show, but doing nothing, <laughs> absolutely nothing at all. It's just to feed the, the media trending about this uh, so-called full spectrum LED. That's well, unfortunately, even today, we still have the green and red LED here. Actually, the green and red LED contribute to the so-called disco ball effect. For matter of fact, if you buy a, a eBay black box, you smash the green and red LED. <laughs> you just use the blue and white. There is no disco ball effect. Seriously. Did, yeah, that, have, you, have you done? Uh, have you actually yeah. collected data on this, uh, Dong, and, and seen uh, any uh, you know differences in terms of what you're talking about with the uh, with the green and red really not mattering? Uh, for matter of fact, that I I when I have the I used to have all hydras, so many hydra, AI hydra, and then as I I have part of it have the red and green on on pretty high too. And part of it has no red and green. There's absolutely no difference. There's really no difference at all because that, and also the amount of power this red and green come out is insignificant. It doesn't even trigger the photosynthesis. Seriously, it just come in for the show. There's absolutely no reason to have them at all because your white LED already have that spectrum color. So that, and, and that is why all LED these days only allocate very tiny amount of wattage onto the red and green LED because they know the red and green just for show, nothing more than that. When you it's say just, just for, uh, when you say just for show, what do you mean by just for show in terms of uh, just the, uh, the look in terms of the, uh, the, no, for the marketing, 
for the marketing. It just yep. If you turn on the red and green, it doesn't impact the color much at all. Um, and then, uh, then uh, back to the LED. The so uh, I was using the Hydra. That's when this contraption comes out. I want to design my own, and of course, there's a cost factor there. And uh, everybody knows that commercial LED and then like the AI, radio, they're very expensive. Uh, then everybody, that, that's when what driven me, one of the reasons for this guy. But actually, I want to put in a note about uh, for everybody, for all the hobbyists. Uh, when you look at the Radeon, they're so expensive, you have to understand why they're so expensive. The reason for that is that uh, LED as a product, it depends on how much they manufacture, what's the market. Uh, uh, how many units they manufacture. If you're making thousands, hundreds of thousands of them, of course, the cost is going down. But you, if you're, uh, because our hobby is a niche market, and the Radeon the only make in, a, uh, like AI Radeon, they make in a limited amount of number. The cost actually is reasonable, seriously, even though they cost so much. But seriously, for a business standpoint, so I'm into the business side also, then look at all these uh, costs or whatever thing, all that kind of thing. Uh, it's not surprised me that they cost that much. And for a matter of fact, um, well, you, uh, if you're really at, at a consumer at that level, uh, you can afford it, why not? But now here comes the uh, reason. Actually, I use uh, currently, one besides this uh, relic of this uh, uh, mass spec razor, but these two mass spec razor is not doing the, the major lifting for photosynthesis. It is rebuilder LED bars. They're 80 watt each, the three of them. They're doing the heavy lifting for this tank. Um, because I'm, I, I'm a guy, I, I, very difficult to let go of things that's still usable. I actually I repair this, I replace the, power, the LED puff, replace a lot of things, I keep them running. Uh, but then I'm, but at the age of LED, of course, LED do age. That means that you don't expect LED last forever. Um, that's why I'm really not counting on them to do the heavy lifting for photosynthesis. The heavy lifting is the rebuilder LED bars. So right now in my system, so uh, I migrated from AI to rebuilder after I met rebuilder and look at that LED. At the beginning, I don't buy it because uh, uh, at the beginning, uh, I always believe in this uh, color blending thing. I have this uh, called a white paper method. You have an LED turn on, you stuck a white paper underneath it, you shouldn't see all the color separation. That's at that time, is my holy grail mm. of LED. Is that, yeah, because I believe that matters because I come out from a metal halide background. Metal halide, uniform. What about, uh, light. So I think what about T5s? Uh, but actually, let me Go uh, ahead. put on that, but no longer true, seriously. The coral doesn't care. <laughs> <laughs> so this color blending thing, the coral does not care a bit. What the coral do care about is the power value and also, well, the shadow, and then comes to the spectrum. Uh, that's in terms of spectrum, uh, because the, all the water are rippling, they basically even things out about all this uh, disco ball effect, the, or, or called color separation. Um, even though that, uh, and if I show you a rebreather, let's hang. Even though all the LED, you stuck a white paper underneath it, you see all the different dots, different color. But in your tank, you don't see that often. Well, you don't see that basically right. none. So um, then I start testing out uh, rebreather's light um, uh, alongside with AI. And then uh, what happened is that we've half the cost <laughs> of the rebreather light. And then uh, versus AI, AI is a wonderful light. And no doubt about it, it's gray light. Uh, but for coral farming, every penny counts, you know? <laughs> yeah, it does. As a, to, yeah, to run a business is that your cost of the business is a major factor. Sometimes it's, uh, it's, uh, it's a deal breaker for the cost to try to cut down the cost. So that is one thing is that uh, uh, that's why I, I start to investigate and looking at the rebuild LED with half the cost. And they also utilize the same LED chip at the time. Even today, they're all basically the same type of LED chips uh, inside the AI, radio, and the rebreather. So there's no major difference. 
So, um, hey, a quick question, uh, Dong. Yeah, Bert, Bert Minshew was uh, asking, is his reef breeder's custom or standard? Are you using a, a custom um, setup or it's just a standard um, uh, light, light uh, setup spectrum, I guess, for the uh, reef breeders? Uh, the, uh, if he means standard, that means to come with that remote control? No. Uh, no uh, the, all the reef breeder lights, the remote control come from the factory and not the default setting. And that's whatever on their remote control, the program is for them to test the light. So you have to change the setting after you get a rebreather light by using your remote. Or the, the, for, the, for the pro version, it's a different story. The pro version has different profile. And the LPS profile, SPS profile, whatever profile in there is perfectly good. Set and forget, done. No need to uh, tweak too much about it. But for the older version that still use a remote control, yes then the, uh, do not use the whatever program inside the remote control, but put in a custom one in there. There are plenty of custom one available online, if I answer that question. So we're getting uh, we're getting some comments about the T5s and all that stuff. Greg okay. Carroll is like, let them continue with the, L Greg Carroll said, let them continue with the LED talk. T5 is history and Filipino reefer is T5 is the best. So uh, Don, what are your thoughts in terms of uh, T5s? Is that an old technology at this point or is that uh, still uh, worthwhile running over a tank? Okay, first of all, T5 is not history. It's nowhere close to history. <laughs> but matter of fact, uh, the critical growth of my coral, I don't know if I can kill my camera. Uh, I uh, do you see that, 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 my, see that tank? Which one? The uh, the yep, flat? The one the, in the back. The one in the back, the big coral flat? Yep, the big yeah. coral flat. Yep. Okay, and let me uh, turn this uh, uh, light back on. Uh-oh. Uh-oh, you lost your uh, you lost uh, your ring light? Yeah, my my ring light actually ran out of battery. Let me go get another battery real, real quick. Then you, you can look at my coral flat. Uh, yeah, I mean, <laughs> folks, I've, I've visited uh, Dong's place several times, and it's been a while. I gotta, I gotta come back and visit you, Dong. But uh, oh, always welcome. This dude is the real deal. Let me tell you, he uh, go. Okay, he's uh, still looking for another battery. Yep, I got the battery. <laughs> so, um, um, so, but Dong, Dong, uh, you gotta see this stuff to believe it. And uh, if you're ever in the Boston area, just. Uh, I guess the best way for people to, to find you, Dong, is uh, through Boston Reefer Society? Oh, yes. Uh, I have my contact information there. Uh, let's see. Oh, wait a minute. I think the ring light probably is dead. Yeah, don't worry about it, man. We're good. We can see you. Okay. Uh, I was just giving... I was okay. just... Uh, I, yeah, it's not too yeah, bad. Yeah, not bad at all. So, all right, you're talking about okay. your coral flat there. I was just... Uh, I was okay. giving a shout-out to your business. Oh, thank you very much. <laughs> Uh, I always welcome to, to come visit me. Um, okay, well well worth back. the visit. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. So uh, to sum it up about T5, my most critical coral, they're all mini colonies. Okay. Uh, my uh, private reserve, the one that keep the lineage for past like over decade, this coral, they are under ATI T5. <laughs> that that is how I treat. Uh, that, that that's my my view about T five. T five basically is the king of the line so far. Well, except metal halide. Well, uh, but I still uh, want my AC. Uh, metal halide is just too hot. <laughs> if I can, uh, 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 well, to run metal halide, yeah, I run metal halide. But other than metal halide. The best option is T5. Why is that? First of all, the T5 give a very uniform light field. Uh, for matter of fact, for Acropora, I'm talking about Acropora. Yeah, if you're talking about Zoensis or LPS, your option is basically unlimited. Right. They're really not much different for LPS under T5, metal halide, or LED. But Zoensis, it doesn't really matter. You can use a flashlight, seriously, for Zoensis. <laughs> huh. But we're talking about Acropora. So this is what Aqua Garden yeah. is for. That's my passion for Aqua So in the wild, in the ocean, Aquapora actually happened pretty deep in the ocean. At their location, what they see is a uniform, even light field. Oh, a little bit blue, bullish, uh, uniform light field. 
there's not a lot of shimmer and whatever thing if there's any, but it's very diffuse. Uh, that is what the T5 actually mimicking is a light panel. Give you very even lighting, basically eliminate your shadow. All the colony grow in a very uh, uh, nature natural form. Here is important thing about Aquapora. Not only the color, the growth rate, the also important thing about the growth form, how the colony grow from a frag into a, uh, a colony, what the shape it looks like. It actually matters. So what happened is that under LED, well, uh, I used to do a study. I have a castle. I have an AI. I have, a, uh, that's a 24-inch T5 and a very fast-growing aquapora. So then I set them up several months later and uh, uh, that that acro i use is uh, all come from the same colony and which is uh uh what do you call it is a tabling acro yep. because the, uh, actually can you see this guy here yeah i can see i can see yeah that's a very yeah that's a very nice yep. table okay under the castle it grows like a crab <laughs> because of the shadowing so that frag basically flat out from a, from a side. It is absolutely terrifying looking. Uh, yes. Under the, 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 uh, the uh, Hydra, there's the more upward bare branches. Uh, it's more um, natural looking yeah. to my yeah. eye. Under T5, it's absolutely beautiful. A very beautiful table, evenly grown. And, but of course, you, you, you can achieve the same effect uh, by populating your whole top of the aquarium with LED. Basically, this is edge, close to edge to edge illumination yep. here. It's, this is all about the shadowing. LED casts a very harsh shadow. Just like if you put a pencil on the LED light, you can see the shadow is so harsh. Um, that is why the ideal lighting for SPS is to try to populate the whole top of your tank with light. Coverage. Actually, it's You're not saying by coverage. Diffuser. Yeah. yeah, coverage. Well, coverage doesn't mean diffuser. Diffuser doesn't do jack. I can tell you that. <laughs> diffuser does not create new light source outside of, of uh, the light area already. Yes. You can smack a uh, diffuser onto LED, does not make your coverage better. It let, allow the light to spread wider, but at a still at an <laughs> angle at, on the outer edge. It does not work on Aquapora. Diffuser is a waste of money, totally not working, absolutely not worth considering. Seriously, they cut down so much power. And it does not change the characteristic of the light because the, the light has to come out physically from a light source going down to the tank. That's how to eliminate shadow. It's not by putting a diffuser on the puck. That does not uh, uh, solve your shadowing problem. That is the bottom line. That is why that metal halide requires a gigantic yeah. refractor because the light beam hit the refractor physically coming down. That is what's important. The light has to physically exist on the side, to shining on the side of your coral. That way that to eliminate shattering. And for aquapora, especially tabling aquapora, is really affected uh, by shattering. It's by, so the ideal situation is to have your LED totally populated your tank, the, the, the top. But that means very big money. Yeah, 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 no. Uh, I... That is where T5 yep. comes in. Okay, now, uh, first of all, the diffuse, even lighting from T5. Second thing is that every time you change your bulb, your light becomes brand new again. And my ATI, the oldest one is 17 year dimmable on its original ballast. I only use ATI ball, probably that's, that, that's the only option available. And you can burn those ball uh, ATI uh, for approximately 1.5 years. Do not change it every six months. That's why I tell everybody locally, if you want to toss your ball in six months, toss it my <laughs> You'll way. You'll take it, right? <laughs> yeah, I take yeah. it. <laughs> I mark the age of the ball and then I continue to use it. Uh, so if you're running T5 every 1.5 years and your life become brand new again. Let's talk about, uh, you cannot do that on an LED. LED, basically, the whole fixture is disposable. Yeah, and, and uh, so, I guess it yeah. depends on the LED fixture, but we, I, I've heard uh, numbers like around five years or something like that. you got to pretty much replace the, uh, the mm -hmm. LED because it's, it's going to start losing its intensity. Yes, absolutely true. But except one thing interesting is about the rebuild lights. So 
Uh, that's another reason I choose the rebreather light. So the, uh, primarily my lighting currently use, besides these two dinosaurs, uh, is ATI T5, rebreather photon LED. And I actually, I got two uh, AI Hydra back because that, well, I found these two. And you just this kind of uh, try to bring back the old memory. They still work yeah. great. So, uh, but those hydro is working on a non-critical tank. There you go. <laughs> so, yeah. So for all the critical mission, uh, API T5 and plus the the uh, the rebreather LED. So the one of the reason I found that that uh, rebreather does that nobody, no other people do, is that they use 48 volt power supply. Here's the thing. So uh, I talked to many engineers about LED. The LED degradation actually caused by uh, heating. Overheat or the heat does not get uh, dissipated sufficiently. That's what caused the LED um, the denomination or whatever. Then we'll, we'll, uh, LED will lose its power. Uh, the, also, uh, that you need replacement, that kind of thing. But think about this way, this way, at the same voltage, for example, if I are uh, running at uh, 96 volt, a uh, 96 watt WATT, this light, if the power coming into the LED is 24 volt, that means that I need to have more current going through the chips, LED chips. We talk about electricity current. But when we replace the, the power supply to a higher voltage power supply, the current going through the LED chips actually drops. Yeah. So a 48 volt power supply versus 24 volt power supply, that means that the current going through your LED chips uh, drop in half and still give you the same watt wattage. But then because your current is lower, so you generate less heat. So uh, yeah, this is theoretical, right? I can provide you uh, a practical thing. I have one LED light, rebreather LED light, is dated 2015. Mm all these years, the power value, no significant difference. Oh, really? Oh, so yeah. So it, has, it hasn't it has really lost any, uh, any power over the years? No, no, oh. not at all. And, and yeah, and uh, one important thing is that the fan doesn't even come on most of the time. Most of the time, the, it's not even, the fan doesn't even come on because it's cool enough. The reason for that is that it's a gigantic heat sink. The whole body is solid aluminum, gigantic heat sink. So that is why uh, the, the heat get just transferred out very effectively. That longevity of the LED is much better. That's one thing. Second thing is that I got a question from a guy say, why they're cheaper? They're significantly cheaper than the, the competitive competitors. Well, the answer is very simple. Rebreather LED is not manufactured by Rebreather himself. Logan is a fantastic great guy. I want to plug, give him a thumbs up here. Uh, rebreather LED actually manufactured by Evergrow in China. And they are basically, it's a horticulture LED made in a much larger quantity and with the reef spectrum uh, built into the chips. The, basically what they call the, the, the spectrum, the blend of LED, but the body, everything else is from a horticulture LED. So they were manufactured, they are manufactured in a much larger quantity. That's mm. why they're cheaper. Gotcha. Uh, but in, in terms of the quality, it's top notch. That is why I, uh, that's the, 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 besides the ATI and this rebreather. And when these two dinosaurs kick the bucket, I just replaced with two <laughs> rebreather over there. Don, you always have a very unique uh, perspective, and I always learn something new when I uh, when I talk to you. And and you had you had a lot of um, you know very interesting points tonight. If <laughs> if, if we uh, if we wrap it up and and let's say um, in in three three main bullet points in terms of how people can uh, kind of get to that next level in terms of keeping SPS, what would you say are the three most important things or that, you know, people should focus on um, to, uh, to get there? Okay. Number one thing, do your water change. Very important. I, I guess that, that. that I was going to guess that yeah, water change. Yeah, Water change is very important <laughs> and invest it, uh, invest in a good salinity meter. I have seen so many people uh, with the salinity totally wrong. And that's why that when a new customer come in, I always ask them, can you bring me a, 
a cup of water. I want to see what the what your salinity is. Uh, the reason for that is that I grew this coral. They're my babies, so I do care yeah. about them. Even they go to the new home, so I want to make sure that uh, the new home has uh, is uh, is good enough. It's good for them. So that's why I ask people, well, can you bring a cup of water? So the only thing I want to see is the salinity. That's a re- because the reason for that is that uh, hyd- the, the, the meter, the refractometer, back uh, like 20 years ago, precisely make, all the marking is precise. Not anymore. Now you buy one from Amazon for 20 bucks. Oh, no, those things are not precise at all. That's why if you calibrate the, re- the, the meter using calibration fluid, such as uh, 35 PBT, very, clo- very close to the point you try to keep your tank at, and then you can get a pretty accurate reading from that meter. But unfortunately, many of these meter come with the instruction manual saying that calibrate it at you're using RODI. Oh my God, that's every time I, I see that the people calibrate their the meter using RODI, the salinity actually is much lower than they think. So that is why do your water change, use a good salt, and also use a good way to measure your salinity. So uh, what I do is I actually use a refractometer calibrated with a seawater standard and also use a hand uh, uh, salinity meter at the same time. And if I feel like it, I grab my hydrometer. <laughs> just in case. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, just in case. And then uh, to make sure that they're all in the same range. So, uh, but keep in mind that the three reading, your bopping little hydrometer and your uh, hand probe, or your Apex Pro, uh, and also your refractometer, they will read slightly different because they're measuring property of your seawater. But uh, you, uh, the, the range is pretty big, 1.024 to 1.030, because that some part of the ocean actually is that high in salinity. I just don't, I just try to avoid salinity is too low. And now comes the salt, because everybody think about it, I use instant ocean recrystal salt. Uh, the reason for that is that I test basically every major brand of salt, everything uh, throughout the past, what, uh, how many years? So every time I will use one system, test the salt at least six months. The conclusion is that I do not see any significant difference. Mm. Nothing. Only difference is to my wallet. Some of them are just so hurtful, so painful. <laughs> and so right now, the, the red crystal, and I can buy it from Amazon. I don't even bother go through wholesale. Thirty nine ninety nine, drop ship to your door the next, next day. Cannot ask better than that. That's cheaper than wholesale. So I use Instant Ocean Red Crystal. By buying uh, this uh, inexpensive salt, that allow me to do more water change. Seriously, if you're using $120 a bucket salt, and you probably think about it, oh, should I do that water change or not? It's, it's really a lot of money. Uh, but if you're talking about $40 salt, oh, why not, right? I just do a water change, do more water change. Uh, then there's a, here comes the biggest uh, concern about people about Eastern Ocean, about Red Crystal, is about all this brown stuff that coating your bucket. Yep. Yep. I, what I can tell you that that is absolutely not a concern at all. So... Yeah, Why I, I, I've uh, yeah, I've experienced that. And I've never had any, um, you know, I don't think I've had any not negative yep. side effects using the uh, IO, but uh, yeah, definitely uh, coats the uh, containers. That's for sure. So I uh, actually look into what exactly those things are. Those are actually mostly not from the salt at all. So what happened is that like uh, Red Crystal, I uh, used the ocean. They're one big giant manufacturer for a lot of like public aquarium, whatever that kind of thing. Uh, they actually have uh, anti-caking reagent there, very fine powder in their salt mix to prevent them to cake up. And in my past experience of one brand of salt, I bought a batch of them. After three months, half of it all become a solid block. That, and that salt uh, was advertised as a fast mixing salt. There's no anti-caking reagent in there, but it cakes up. And now I actually have to use them on my driveway in the winter. So uh, <laughs> those anti-caking reagent is a very, very fine powder. They coat the barrel. And now what is brown stuff actually are bacterials. So because your water goes through from the tap, pass through your RODI or the coordinator, 
is no longer have the ability to inhibit bacterial growth. The brown sludge actually is not from your salt, it's from the bacterial growth accelerated by the coating of the anti-caking reagent. It's not your salt, it's something in your air. <laughs> really? like bacterial growth. Yeah, there's a bacterial growth because that uh, anti-caking reagent actually providing a, a bed of a very good bed for bacterial growth. Just like those, uh, if you put a new egg crack in your tank, the dino start to grow, dino start to grow, because there are new egg crack, the surface actually providing a good place for bacteria to grow. That is what happened to your bucket with all this brown sludge. It's not from the salt. And it's perfectly fine. There's absolutely no reason to, 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 to spend more money to buy a so-called better just salt. Makes the, it just it makes everything dirty. Yeah. That's the only thing I don't like about it. But uh, yeah. Well, yeah, yeah, you know. that, that, that is a personal choice. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. I hear you. And, and uh, the other thing is that no matter what a salt manufacturer claim, nobody are able to find a pattern on it because that they're all based on public formula. Just one has a little bit uh, more uh, alkalinity, more calcium, toss in there, and charge you a big bucks. And actually lots of the salt cost actually from the shipping cost. Try to imagine you ship this 55 pound bucket all the way from Europe to here, how much does that cost? Versus the drop shipping from US, like the Instant Ocean, the drop ship to the door, and that it costs a lot less. So basically, that, that's the majority yep. of thing about salt. Yep. So water change, good salinity meter, and use us with salt. So, so well, there's bad salt there, but I'm not going yeah. over there. <laughs> so uh, Greg Carroll makes a good point because I know there's been a lot of uh, chatter in the in the uh, in, in the comments here about. Um, whether people like to use big companies or small companies. And of course, this live stream is uh, sponsored by two uh, big companies. And I know, Dung, you're very, um, you know, you, you use a lot of different products and, and services. And, you're, you know, you seem also to be very much uh, kind of like, um, you know, you, you, you follow data and you, you, you pretty much, you know, you're kind of like a do-it-yourself kind of guy, I think. I mean, that's kind of so, uh, somewhat. No. Not, not to, all right, so that, ignore that Actually, last no. statement. But what Greg says is some people want to bash companies, but this hobby doesn't survive without them. Whether you use big or small companies, mm -hmm. they all yep. make this hobby what, um, what it, uh, what, what, what it looks is. Um, I think that's a very important thing to say. I think there's, uh, there's a lot of different options. There's a lot of different, um, you know, ways that you can go in this hobby. Right. And I think, uh, Dong, you've yes. proven that, yes. that, uh, you know, you're, you're not a, uh, I wouldn't say you're, you're conventional in terms of some of your methods and, and, uh, you know, the equipment that you use. Um, but there's many different ways to skin this cat in terms of reef keeping. And there's many yes. different options yeah. and a lot of different people have a lot of success doing a lot of different methods. So I think it's, uh, I think it's a very healthy conversation to be talking about, you know, not just focusing on, on one type of uh, company, whether it's a big or small company. And I think, uh, yeah, I think we as uh, hobbyists and consumers out there, it, this is good information, right? Because we're sharing information. You're sharing information in terms of what works for you you know, and, and I have other folks yep. on that share information about what, what works for them. Um, I share information in terms of what works for me. We're not, you know, we're not, uh, I'm not right. You're not right. I mean, it, it works for you, right? So it's, it's not the end all yes. be all. And I think that's a very important thing to, uh, to say is that, um, there, there are, that's the great thing about this hobby. There really is. It's not, uh, it's not a yes, catch all. Yes. It's not a catch all. Um, and that's, uh, I think that you, you have a wonderful point about uh, this is a hobby. This is not like FDA examining a drug or something like that. This is a hobby. There are many ways you can make this ho hobby works. And also you have to factor in the human enjoyment. If I like the look of a radiant because they look prettier, cleaner in my living room, go for it. That is because it's a hobby. It's not uh, something like a scientific study. It's a hobby. So if you're using some equipment that you feel good to using it, go ahead, because this is a hobby that you should do that. For example, that uh, I, I use a J-Bow pump, you get the job done. Uh, well, so you, if I have a tank in my living room, which I don't, I probably put on some more fancy stuff there and then they all look better. And because it's a hobby, there is an aspect of uh, how, how you enjoy it. Because as a hobbyist, well, I'm a, Basically, I'm a coral farmer, so I look at things differently, but also I'm a hobbyist too. So for my, for my hobby, if I move this tank upstairs, oh, I would put a radio on there. I put some uh, nice uh, 
the power head there, and I show people how the lightning, whatever thing, I enjoying it, I like it, because as a hobbyist, do whatever, or get the equipment that uh, you enjoy to use. And as long as they're not junk, but the, the good thing is that everything, most of the thing that sell at a re- reputable uh, vendor for equipment wise, right. like Bot Resupply, uh, saltwateraquarium.com, it's very trustworthy. Right. It's, with all this option there, it's about your own choice and uh, about your own affordability. That's a very important thing. Yeah, everybody want a, want a Ferrari, a Lamborghini. But the thing is that if a Honda do well and I can afford a Honda, well, that's perfectly yeah. great. Yeah, right? what works for so, you. Know. Uh, yeah, yeah you, you, whatever works for you and it, it works. And then uh, that's why for all the big vendors, basically there is a... Uh, uh, it, uh, with all these vendors like Bowery Supply, like uh, saltwateraquarium.com, they provide us all the options. And they're not like shoving something in your throat that you have to buy this, only carry this. They carry everything. That uh, With this option, just choose whatever is affordable to you and whatever is uh, please you in this yep. hobby. And one important thing about it is that in this hobby, I see many people is dumping so much money in, in something and eventually... Uh, their wife said, "Either you get rid of this thing or <laughs> get rid of you." That kind of thing. So, uh, as a hobby uh, point of view, that should be considered. Everybody, but want the most expensive, the the the, the flashy stuff. Everybody want to want an LV bag, or whatever thing. But the thing is that, uh, just as a for hobbyist, just consider um, to 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 do whatever suitable for you financially and the uh, the method you like to do. Uh, actually, I, I, I know that a lot of people follow method A, method B, uh, because that uh, uh, this is a hobby. By following a method, is like experimenting. Well, if that brings you joy, why not do that? There's nothing wrong with that. So uh, unless that uh, somebody tell you that uh, you need to keep your salinity at 1.0000, and this is called the zero method, then, of course, you shouldn't follow it. But most of the time, and a lot of popular things that people are doing, on the uh, Reef Hobby, are basically, yeah, the, the, nothing wrong with those kind of things. Like ICP testing, they have a good, useful thing. And uh, so the different people have different needs. For example, ICP testing do helps a lot in a lot of situations. One example is that a customer of mine always have this problem that the coral keep dying, cannot all the parameter testing fine using the home uh, or all this regular test kit. But then the coral just lasts for one one week and then just perish. Eventually, that um, uh, I asked him to do an ICP test, and his copper is sky rocketed. What well, it turned out to be, ah, uh, this is very interesting. He was using a power head, our cheapo power head, <laughs> in his tank. Oh. Actually, it's not in his tank. In his thumb to circulate his thumb, because his store told him so. This is the most affordable. Little thing put in there. That thing is leaking electricity and melting. Yeah. It's, and yeah, so that, that is, uh, but then ICB test catch that. The problem solved. Another thing, another o- occasion is that the ICP test actually ca- capture there's a heavy metal, a certain heavy metal is off the chart. It turns out the guy's uh, so called titanium heater is leaching metal. So this is one important thing is that I do not use any metal heaters. Because the titanium heater is not really pure titanium. <laughs> I've seen so many titanium heater that leaching metals, and some of even worse, are leaching electricity. So that is, is uh, well, that's my take on uh, all these uh, options. It's good yeah, thing to have for option. sure. Just choose uh, according to your need. All right. Well, Dong, I think on that note, we're going to, uh, we're going to end the, uh, the stream tonight. I, I think we could have gone on much Great. longer and probably broken records there in terms of passing, uh, one I had on Jake Adams and Meckley. I think, uh, <laughs> I think we could easily break that record, but we're going to, we're going to stop it here. And, uh, I got to pee. So, you know, <laughs> got to, uh, got to, take care of some business but uh listen i want to thank i want to thank dong so much for uh for being a guest on my show dong it was a real pleasure man and i, I hope to see you real soon pay a visit to you there yeah so uh, i also want to thank it is a great honor on your show man i've known you for such a long yeah. time finally yeah. you get on the yep. show 
and I watch every single episode of your show. Well, I actually some of them I watch twice, really three times. Wow, that's uh, yeah, there's so many good information. I really appreciate that. Yeah. Um, so uh, yeah, we'll definitely have you back on, uh, Dong. You're getting a lot of uh, kudos, and and uh, so Dong, how how can they uh, <laughs> find you now in terms of uh, Acro Garden? Oh, actually, uh, here's the thing: is that uh, uh, for the I exclusively sell on uh, on my coral and Boston Reefer, and I also work on, on work with other vendors. And and actually, if you log on to Boston Reefer and look at my uh, uh, sponsor form and all the contact information, my email, my phone number is all on there. It's for public information, so you can uh, contact me by um, sending me an email or uh, texting me or calling me. Uh, another thing is that please join the Boston Reefer Society and you can send me a private message there about you go. that. And I, I, I respond to all these messages well, very, uh, very rapidly. Uh, I, I, I want to, um, well, uh, besides thank you me the opportunity to be on your show, really appreciate it, man. And hopefully that you can be here uh, soon. Then we can look at uh, all the goodies in, uh, in person. Uh, I want to thank Boston Reefer as well. Without Boston Reefer, there won't be any of this <laughs> seriously yeah no yeah absolutely i think um and paul's putting a link to the boston reefers uh, society in the uh, in the chat there so people can uh, go right to it but uh, yeah thanks th thanks again to uh to paul and all the folks at boston reefer society um great organization and uh I, you know i just you know they're uh, they're local to boston but uh, i know there are members that uh, are outside of boston and uh if you uh, have another club nearby you join it you know, it's very important to yep. be a part of a local reefers uh, club. Invaluable. We've talked about that before when I had Paul on as a guest. Absolutely. But um, Absolutely. anyway, so um, wanted to thank again the two sponsors for this live stream, Bulk Resupply and Ecotech Marine. So, um, folks, thank you so much for uh, for tuning in. And, and I mentioned, uh, Paul, thank you for that super chat. And uh, Remy, thank you for that super chat, man. And uh, thanks again to Paul, the uh, the moderator, and also want to let everybody know that all these episodes of Wrapping with Reef Bum are available as podcasts on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Stitcher, and Amazon. My next Wrapping with Reef Bum live stream will be on Thursday, July 21st at 7 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. I'm going to have, this is going to be interesting, Dean Miller, who's a PhD, we're going to have him on talking about the Living Coral Biobank in the Great Barrier Reef. So that should be another great show. If you want to check out the full upcoming schedule of guests on Rampin' with Reef Bum, please visit reefbum.com under the YouTube section. So until uh, next time, be safe and be well, and later.